As a pianist, I often get a lot of questions and messages about how to learn the piano, what it actually takes to learn the piano, or if I can help and make suggestions for particular problems that people are having. So recently, I put out a post on my community page asking if anyone had any questions that they wanted me to answer. And in today's video, I'm going to try and answer 30 of those questions in just 30 minutes. So let's get into it. Number one, I started the new year with the goal of practicing the piano to get significantly better as quick as possible. I played a little when I was younger, but quit when I felt I couldn't progress. I am now feeling the same frustration. I know I need to keep pushing forward, but what do you recommend in this situation? How do I stop myself from getting frustrated with slow progress? Frustration is quite a common thing when you are dealing with learning any skill that takes a long period of time. And the reason that we feel frustration is because we're not meeting our own expectations of where we want to be on the instrument. So there's two things you can do to avoid frustration when you feel like you are making slow progress. Firstly, set goals that are actually achievable and that are achievable within a certain period of time. If you are climbing Mount Everest, you don't look at the top and work out how long it's going to take you to get to the top. You work out how long it's going to take you to get to the first base camp. The second thing I would suggest when you have something that you're working towards is only focus on what you can actually achieve today. Ultimately, there is no such thing as slow progress. You just need to focus on putting one foot in front of the other and trying to be better than you were yesterday. Number two, I've been self-teaching myself for about eight months as piano teachers are quite expensive. I'm currently playing by ear with chords and melodies, but I want to improve my technique as well as my ear training and my ability to improvise when learning by ear. What do you recommend I do to progress? Well, if you want to improve your ability to play by ear as well as your technique, then practice a lot of scales and a lot of arpeggios and chords. When you practice scales and arpeggios from a playing by ear perspective, what you're doing is giving yourself a lot of tools to be able to play with. Then when it comes to playing by ear and you essentially work out the chords, so you've got a set of chords, then you can use those patterns in endless situations with any song. And the more patterns that you practice as a sort of technical exercise, not only will you improve your technique because your hands are are much more in control and able to do what you want them to do but you'll also have a stack of patterns that you can just use on the spot when you're playing something that you've worked out by ear so a process that you could go through is listen to a song that you like work out what the chords are for that song and then use that as a kind of basis for any technical exercise to practice arpeggios using those chords but to also practice the scale that that song is using so you get used to your hands running up and down the piano and you improve your technique that way that will also mean that you're really familiar with all of the different keys that you're going to come across in pieces but you're doing it in a practical way number three how do i make my arpeggios more smooth and play faster at the same time this is actually a problem that is very common and that is that when you play arpeggios a lot of people tend to jump their hand so they're left with a gap and there's two ways that i would practice arpeggios in order to fix this problem. The first way is practice them much slower, focusing on making your hands really even, and also really concentrate on the sound you're making when you're playing it much slower. The second way you should practice is to isolate the actual problem, which is when your thumb crosses under, you should always stop one note after the problem. So if the problem in this case is that jump, then you should stop on the note after the jump. And you can do that at speed. When you are wanting to try and learn to play fast, the key is to do it in a way where you're not going to get it wrong all of the time. Because if you keep getting something wrong, then you're just training it into your hands wrong. So you need to break it down in such a way that you can get it right. Number four. Hey, Matthew, how can I give my playing character? I want to learn how to create emotions in my playing because right now it sounds very dull. Interesting. Well, this depends on the type of piece you're talking about. Because there are often a lot of different clues in a piece of music as to how you might want to characterize the piece. Some of which are the key that the piece is using how fast the piece of music is, and things like that. But one of the most important things you can start to do to actively learn how to characterize a piece of music is to understand the different types of chords, because chords inform the feeling more than anything else. For example, what does this chord feel like? Now, that chord is a major seventh chord. To me, a major seventh chord has a very relaxed kind of passive sound to it. But once again, that can change if things like the rhythm change. The idea is that you need to pay attention to the things in the music that are making it feel the way it does. So what chords make a piece of music feel that way? What speed, what rhythms are being used, what key is it in that are making it feel a certain way? That way, when you come across the rhythm again, or the same type of chord again, or the same key again, and you get the same feeling, 
then you're starting to connect the dots. Question number five. This channel truly deserves more recognition. Thank you. Could you recommend some beginner friendly piano pieces? I've been self-taught for around six to seven months now. Also, is it possible to prepare for graded exams without an in-person teacher? Thanks in advance. Well, firstly, yes, you can prepare for graded exams without an in-person teacher. You can enter yourself for the exam and as well as being able to go to an exam center in order to play for an examiner, you can record yourself playing and submit that to be examined. So yes, you can go through the entire graded system without having a teacher. And the second part to the question, which is, can I suggest some beginner friendly piano pieces. Well, that one's kind of difficult because it really depends on what your particular weaknesses are and also what style of music do you want to play. For more classical based pieces, I suppose I would suggest things like Tchaikovsky's children's album, Opus 39, with pieces like The Sick Doll. Or a little bit harder than that, there's like the Beethoven Bagatelles. Or for something slightly easier and more contemporary, I always suggest the Pam Wedgwood It's Never Too Late to Play Piano book. That is a beginner book, so it starts from the absolute beginner with What Are the Notes? But it also has a lot of popular songs in there and it has some more jazzy type of pieces in and by the end of the book they are quite challenging number six how do I learn improvisation right from the beginning as a self-taught player? I want to be able to create rather than just copy paste. Well, there's nothing wrong with a bit of control C, control V. When you are improvising in itself, you're never really playing anything that's unique. From the beginning, what I would say is that one of the harder parts about improvisation is trying to stay rhythmically in time while you're trying to think of things to play. So at the very, very beginning, I would play something just in C major, just using normal triad chords, which is where you play every other note in the scale. In the left hand, just play a random chord four times before you change it. And then in the right hand, try and play just some of the scale notes, forming some kind of melody against those continuous chords. When you can do that and you can play pretty much whatever you want in the right hand using that scale and you can keep those chords going in the left hand, then it's really just about expanding the chords on the piano and playing with other rhythms. But in order to fully answer that question, I would have to do a full video breaking it down. Number seven. What are sight reading exercises? I hope that isn't a stupid question, but I've never heard of them before. Could you recommend some? Well, sight reading exercises are short excerpts of music that are usually much simpler than what you would normally read as a piece of music. And they're used in order to practice your instant recognition of notes and your ability to play something when you haven't seen it before. I always break music reading down into two categories, and that is reading music and sight reading music. When you're reading a piece of music, you're training your ability to understand music, to interpret music, music and to produce something that sounds nice. When you are sight reading a piece of music, you're seeing it for the first time and you're trying to practice your instant recognition of the notes and your instant recognition of patterns on the page your instant recognition of the key, and your ability to play using the right scale on the piano. Sight reading is a two-step process. First of all, you've got to process the information that you're reading, and then you've got to take that information and translate it into your hands. And that is the process that you're training by sight reading. And if you are an absolute beginner at sight reading, then of course I recommend my sight reading exercise book, which is available as a link in the description. And there's 420 exercises in the exercise book, and it goes from the absolute beginning of sight reading, and it progressively gets harder throughout the book. But the idea is that you read each exercise only once so that you are training your sight reading ability, your ability to instantly recognize the notes rather than practicing it lots of times and using your ability to remember the notes. Number eight, what is your favorite practice routine you've had in your years of playing? I need to get into a good routine other than sitting down at the piano, going through some scales and diving into the piece I'm working on. What is the best way of practicing scales? Should I use Hannon? That's an interesting question. So first of all, more generally speaking, in each practice session, you want to do some form of technical exercises, some form of sight reading and learning pieces. If you are not too interested in being able to work songs out by ear, then learning your pieces is enough ear training because by learning pieces, you're learning to hear nuances in the piece of music. That is a general overview of what an ideal practice session would look like in my opinion. Within that, within your technical exercises, I would always practice scales. And if you have a particular technical weakness, that is coming up in a piece that you're learning, then find a particular exercise to go along with your scales that is going to focus on that particular weakness. And Hannon is very good for doing that because each exercise does focus on a particular problem. For the sight reading part of your practice, spend just five minutes reading something you've never seen before. Ideally, that piece of music will be easier than a piece of music you're learning for a much longer period of time, but 
not too easy. And then when you work on a piece of music that you're learning, don't play through the piece more than once. Before you start working on the piece of music, pick out particular parts of that piece of music that are particular weaknesses and go straight into working on them. That might be learning new notes for the next section of the music. That might be a trill that you've had difficulty with. But a lot of people get trapped in starting from the beginning and playing through it and then sitting there and then starting from the beginning and playing through it again. If you want to be really efficient with your time and get good really fast, then you need to get straight into fixing things. And if you want to just play through the piece for fun, then do it at a time that isn't a dedicated practice session. Number nine, I'm interested in learning symmetrical inversions. What exactly do I need to do? Now, from my understanding, symmetrical inversion is where you play a musical idea or a piece in one hand and you flip it on the piano over either a D or an A flat because from these points, the piano is symmetrical. And by doing this, you can practice the same musical idea in both hands so that you don't get a particularly weak hand. So if you want to do this, pick a phrase of the music that's in the right hand. So for example, if it starts on an E and it was E, F, G, A, B. If you flip this over the note D, then an E becomes a C and you just play the same thing in reverse in the left hand. However, what I would say is that in my opinion, this is kind of a pointless exercise. While you may help your technique slightly, you're much better off doing exercises that are dedicated to helping your left hand with whatever weakness your left hand has. So for example, if you are finding it hard to move your fourth and fifth finger in the left hand, then just practice an exercise in the left hand that helps your fourth and fifth finger. By doing symmetrical inversion, you're wasting time by preparing for something that hasn't happened. And there are lots of pieces dedicated to getting your left hand working. For example, Cherny's Opus 299 number two is a left hand dedicated piece. The problem is correct, which is that the left hand is often weakest, but the solution in my opinion is not the right one. Number 10, what's the first thing you would tell someone that really wants to start learning the piano? Practice little and often and there's two reasons for that. One, it's much easier to stay motivated for a longer period of time if it's a really manageable amount of time that you're practicing for. But also because at the very beginning you're going to take in a lot of information and you're going to have to revisit it a lot of times in order for it to stick. If you spend two hours at the piano on day one of starting the piano then while you might learn a lot from it there's a point where you're going to get diminishing returns within that session of music. It's never going to be as effective as having to walk away from the instrument and come back and then focus on it again several times. So practice little and often. Number 11, can you make more tutorials on ear training? I need it so much. And another comment that was similar, it would be a nice video if you can make an ear training video where we go along the process with you, where you let us try to answer the question of key or bass note before you give us the answer. You have great videos though. Well, thank you. So firstly, yes, I'm happy to make more videos on ear training and yes, I can do it well where I give you the opportunity to work it out first before I answer it for you. I am also currently working on a course on playing by ear, which I have just finished writing. And that will be much more exercise based. So it will help you train in the skills of playing by ear. So that's something to look out for. But I will make more videos on ear training in the future. Number 12, how do you get better at performing live? Well, the short answer to that is by doing it a lot. But there is also a slightly extended answer to that. And that is that I think it's important as you start performing more to get positive experiences of performing because I do think going and playing in front of a hundred people and then everything going badly wrong for you can be really damaging for self-esteem and for future performing opportunities. So I would do it in a much more graduated way and by that I mean try and play in front of one person and if you feel really comfortable doing that then maybe deliberately invite a few people to come and listen to you play. Because the more positive experiences you have performing, the more comfortable you will be performing. The stakes are also much lower. Question number 13. I'm confused about major and minor keys. Would I end up learning 24 keys? Well, it depends how you look at it. So technically speaking, there are 15 different major keys. But for three of those, there are both a sharp and flat version of it. For example, B major is also C flat major. So although it has two different names, you're actually playing the same notes on the piano. That's for the major scales and keys. Now from there, each major scale actually has a relative minor and you can find that out by going down three half steps on the piano. So for example, C major, if you go down three half steps, you get to an A and the scale of A minor and the key of A minor has exactly the same notes in it as C major. So although A minor is a separate scale, you still only really need to know C major in order to work out A minor. So just with that small piece of information, you should be able to work out all of the minor scales from the major scales. But unfortunately, there are three different types of minor scale and they are used for three different things. 
The scale that is exactly the same as its relative major, so A minor with no sharps and flats, that is called the natural minor scale. And if you were reading a piece of music, this is what you would see in the key signature. However, there are two other types of minor scale as well, and that is the harmonic minor scale and the melodic minor scale. And both of these are used for different things. The harmonic minor scale is used for writing chords. And this is the same as the natural minor scale, except the seventh note in the scale is sharpened. So it becomes a G sharp in this case instead of a G. The melodic minor scale is used for writing melodies. And in this case, if the scale is going up, you sharpen the sixth and seventh note. So in this case, that'd be an F sharp and a G sharp. And on the way down, they become natural again, or they become back to what they are for the natural minor scale. So although, yes, there are 12 major scales that you need to know, and there are 12 minor scales with a few variations depending on which minor scale you're using, really, you can work them all out from just those 12 major scales, which is why it's so important to learn the major scales first. Number 14. What's the best first piano keyboard for a beginner that wants to start playing the piano? I would always suggest an 88 key weighted key piano with a sustain pedal. If it has those three things, then you are golden for quite a long time. And it depends on the investment that you want to make into playing the piano. But I always suggest the Yamaha P45, which is what this piano is. I believe there is a link in the description for it as well. Question number 15. How hard do you think Liszt's reminiscences de Norma are in comparison to his etude number six? That's an oddly specific question. Well, Liszt's etude number six is a theme and variations based on Paganini's Caprice number 24. And in the violin world, Paganini's Caprice 24 is known for being very, very difficult. And also it's a very popular piece to play because it kind of shows that you've got to a decent level of skill. And while Liszt's theme and variations based on it, the Etude 6 is difficult, I think because the original material was written for violin, it's much more difficult for a violinist to play the Caprice than it is for a pianist to play the Etude. And that's why I would say that the Reminiscences de Norma are much harder, because there's a lot more musicality involved, as well as technical skill, whereas the Etude 6, along with most Etudes, is purely based on a technical thing which can be trained into your hands. Although I've never played either of those pieces, so maybe I'm wrong. Question number 16, how do I know if a piano piece is too hard for me to play? Well, that depends on how comprehensible the piece is for you. If most of the things on the page you don't understand, or there are a lot of techniques that are gonna take a lot of work to play, then I would say your time is probably better spent on an easier piece. In order for it to be an optimal piece to help you progress, then it wants to be about 10% more challenging than the piece you've played before, with a few new techniques or ideas in there that you're going to have to work on. But then again, you've got to weigh up your motivation for wanting to learn a piece with the difficulty of the piece. Are you happy struggling through a piece because you really, really like it and potentially learning the piano at a much slower pace? That's kind of for you to weigh up. Question number 17. Hi, could you make a tutorial or recommend a previous video you have done on how to add piano accompaniment to songs that don't contain a piano. I play in a band and only use chord charts, but I want to play a lot more than just the chords and I think it sounds boring with just rhythm patterns. Keep making great vids. Well, thanks, and I will try. So this is actually quite a popular question, and I think a lot of people think that in order to be able to play something on the piano, it has to have piano in it. And that is not the case at all. But I suppose in this context, if you are playing a piano part in a band, and the band is already playing all of the instruments that are in the original song, then what can you as a piano player add to that piece of music? And there's two things I would think about in this situation. One is think about the frequencies at which the instruments are playing. A guitar is going to be playing sort of middle notes. A singer is also probably going to be in this kind of upper middle range. So on the piano, which part of the frequency range can you fill in that isn't already being played by another instrument? Can you make the music sound much warmer by adding some of this lower middle range? Or can you make the music sound more twinkly by adding some higher stuff? And also, can you spice up the chords that are written in the chord chart by adding some extra notes to those chords? For example, if the chord chart says play an F chord, can you play an F with a G in it as well, opposed to that's something that you as a pianist are going to be able to do that other instruments can't do. A bass guitar can't add more interesting notes in. And although a guitar, for example, can add more notes in, they're probably not going to. So you as a pianist can add a lot of character to a piece of music that wouldn't otherwise be there 
by altering some of those chords slightly. Question number 18. Hi, I started learning the piano using Simply Piano and it worked for about six to eight months, but I want to get better. How would you recommend finding a good teacher and how do piano lessons work in real life? Well, firstly, you want to find a piano teacher who can do or has done what you want to do. And also it might take a little bit of trial and error finding a piano teacher that you like and you really get on with. If you are 17 and really like anime music and want to be able to play that on the piano and you go to a 90 year old who has only ever played Bach, then the likelihood is that they're not going to be a good fit for you. You probably want to find someone much younger and really cool like I am. But for most piano lessons, in the first lesson, the teacher's probably going to be working out what exactly it is you're trying to achieve and also what you're missing in your playing and what you need to do to try and fix that. And then from there, they'll probably give you pieces of music that you want to learn or pieces of music that will help you fix a problem that you have. And then you just need to trust them and practice. And also don't be afraid of telling your teacher if you don't like playing a certain piece of music or you want to change something about how you're practicing because a good teacher should adapt to you. Question number 19, what is the best way to learn music theory, books, courses, etc.? There are some good book series. So the ABRSM music theory and practice books are very good. If you are starting from the very beginning or you want to try and understand a particular concept. But I think the best way to learn music theory really is to take one concept and learn it really well practically. An example of this would be the use of cadences. And this is used in classical music as kind of the end of a phrase or it's used in jazz music like a 2-5-1. And this one theoretical concept is used all the time in music. But in order to be able to really understand it, you need to be able to play it in lots of different keys on the piano and practice using it. And you can find lots of different concepts like that on YouTube, but you've just got to put them into practice. Number 20, can I make any progress with a 61 key keyboard? If yes, what kind of progress can I expect? Well, yes, of course you can make progress on a 61 key keyboard. However, it's not going to last you very long. You can't really practice anything technical and build up your technique in your hands because there's no resistance on the keys. There's also often not a sustain pedal, so you can't practice pedaling. And a lot of the time, there aren't enough keys to practice things like playing octaves in the left hand. So while you can learn to read music, you can learn how to actually play the notes, and you can play things on a 61 key keyboard, it's not ideal for learning for very long. And it's much better to invest in something that has 88 keys as early as possible. Number 21, what's the best acoustic piano brand? That depends on the budget because I would say Steinway are the best in my opinion. But if you look at a Steinway grand piano, like a Model B or something, then you're looking at like £100,000. There are also Bosendorfers grand pianos, which are very, very good. But the best piano for normal playing and normal people for everyday use is a Yamaha U3, in my opinion. Either a Yamaha U3 or a Yamaha U1. Question number 22. What's your favourite song to play on the piano? Well, that's difficult. That's kind of like saying, what's your favourite song to listen to? It changes all the time. But to be honest, a lot of the time when I'm just playing for fun, I do a lot of improvising and making stuff up. The reason for that is because I feel like it can more accurately capture what I feel at the time. And I find that a lot more fulfilling. Question number 23. Can you please explain the playing mechanics of the song Binary Data 4 by Alfonso Peduto? Now, I haven't heard of this piece before. I don't know whether I can explain the playing mechanics, as in what's actually happening with the piano, but I can explain what's happening. Every time he presses a key on the piano, it plays it three times, almost like a triplet. So when he presses it once, it plays like this. This means that when he plays a lot of notes that are repeated one after the other, they're all being played three times and it makes this really complex sounding piano piece. When you play a note like that and it repeats itself afterwards, that's called delay. And it's often an effect that is added to pieces of music afterwards in post-production rather than as it's happening. And I have no idea the actual mechanics behind how he's made his piano do that because he is playing an acoustic piano and the key is actually going down three times rather than just the ones that he's pressed. And it's an interesting concept and a really interesting piece. I do think it's probably possible to play that piece without any effects. It would just make it a lot more difficult to play. Question number 24. Hi, Matthew. I've been learning piano by myself for a couple of months now, focusing on classical pieces and studying music theory. My goal is to create my own simple pieces of music or make arrangements of songs. Is it possible to achieve this by practicing classical pieces and studying music theory? And am I on the right path? 
Well, you can definitely learn a lot by learning classical music and music theory, and music theory will help a lot because you'll understand how music is written and what are the best things to do in order to achieve the effects that you want to achieve. But if you want to create your own pieces, the only real way of getting good at that is by doing it. Learning music theory and how chords work is going to help both with arranging pieces of music and writing your own music, so that is definitely a good thing to do. But if your goal is to get good at writing music, then you need to write music. And at first, you might not be very good at it, but once you've written a piece of music, you can learn from that process, and that's going to make you a better writer. So I would definitely say keep learning music theory and learn classical pieces as a means of getting good at the instrument yourself. But if you want to learn how to write music, then you need to write music. Question number 25. Is it possible to make lesson packages for beginner, intermediate, and advanced players in video format? I would love to buy something like this, then I can revisit it whenever I want. The short answer is yes, and as I said, I'm currently building a playing by ear course, which is proving to be quite an undertaking. But after I've completed that, I do plan on making some more beginner, intermediate, advanced level courses or sets of videos. Question number 26. Hey Matthew, I am a pianist and I love your videos as they provide simple explanations of musical concepts that also go deep into detail. Do you have any tips for Moonlight Sonata Movement 3? I'm learning it at the moment and I would love if you could explain the chords for some of the sections and what emotions they evoke and also how to handle some technical sections of the piece. Thank you. Sure, so there are four main techniques that I would consider to be required for Moonlight Sonata Movement 3. The first one is the idea of broken chords. Now, a broken chord is just where you play a chord, so C major, and you separate out the notes and then you start on the second note of the chord and do the same again and work your way up the piano. And this is what is happening in this particular piece. The second technique that you need is the idea of alternating notes. And in this piece, a lot of the time you have a note that stays the same and a note that changes. The third technique that you need is a technique called the Alberti bass. And this is where you take a chord and you play the bottom note, the top note, the middle note, the top note. And the fourth technique is scales, because there are a lot of scales in this piece. And you can practice each of those skills in isolation using normal scales or things like that, if you find that any of those particular techniques are a challenge. With how to approach the piece in terms of chords and emotion, there is, as there always is, a lot in this piece. And I'll give you an idea as to how I would approach the opening of this piece. So the opening of the piece is in C sharp minor, and it feels kind of manic because you've got these broken chords. But there are two things that are happening. Firstly, the bass note is descending by one note at a time. Which means that alongside those broken chords that are moving up the piano, it's kind of expanding outwards, so therefore feels like it's getting bigger. But the second thing, and the more important thing to me, is that the third chord actually forms something called a dominant seventh, which is a C-sharp major chord with a B on the top. And this means that we're actually changing key to F sharp, and that's where we land next. And then straight after that, we get an A dominant seven, which means we're changing key again, and we go to G sharp. So the piece starts with C sharp minor, and that's what we expect. Then it goes to G sharp major, and that's chord five, and we also expect that. But then we get a dominant seven, which we don't expect, and changes key to here. And then we get an A dominant seven, which we also don't expect, which takes us to here. So you're getting this kind of tension and release, and then tension and then release. And knowing this means that you have these kind of furious broken chords that are ascending up the piano. You have that bass note, which is making it feel like it's getting much larger. But you also have these moments where it's changing key and you get into lean on that tension and then release the tension as it moves through these different keys. It's very interesting. Question number 27. How can I play classical music better? Well, that's a very broad question, but I think a lot of classical music comes down to analysing what you're actually playing. I think in order to be able to play classical music really well, you have to just really know why you're playing things the way you are playing them, rather than just playing it in a certain way because you've either been told to or you've heard someone else play it that way. Question number 28. How do I sign up for lessons with a professional and more specifically, at what point should I I do so? Well, it depends on what your goals are and what you want to get out of the piano. If you want to become a great classical pianist and you want to go to music college, etc., then get a teacher straight away. If you are more of a passive hobbyist player, 
that you are getting stuck with certain problems or you don't know how to progress and that's a good time to get a teacher or if you're someone that just wants to play a little bit of piano and a couple of chords that can help you play some pop songs then maybe you'll never need a teacher a teacher is just someone who has been there and done it and can help you get over any obstacles that you want to get over they can also be a good way of holding you accountable and keeping you practicing so if you're the type of person that needs someone in order to be able to hold you accountable then that's a good reason to get a teacher but it really depends on what your goals are and what you want to get out of learning the piano question number 29 hi matthew i'm a self-taught pianist and i play worship music i can read chord charts but i'm struggling to add rhythm to my playing do you have any advice keep up the good work your videos are really well made and interesting one of the best piano youtube channels out there thank you thank you i appreciate that my advice with chord charts and playing chords especially for worship music is to keep it simple and then slowly expand from there as with playing by ear and many other things you're building up a catalogue of things that you can do on the piano. For example, if you have a couple of chords that you are playing like this to start with, it can be quite overwhelming to think, how can I turn that into something that's more interesting on the piano? All you need to do is develop the idea by adding one thing. So, for example, instead of just playing straight chords in this case, I might alternate the notes like this. Once you're really comfortable with that, then you might add an extra bass note in. After that, you might alternate four note chords. Then you can play the three left hand notes separately. And you can see how over several weeks you can add tools to your toolkit in order to make your chords sound more interesting. When you go to play your chord chart, think what one thing can I add to this to make this sound maybe slightly more interesting or what one thing can I try out? Question number 30. I am a beginner at the piano. I've been playing for only three months and I have trouble producing equal volume with every finger. If I have to play piano for five notes, then each finger sounds at a different volume. Is there any exercises or something that I can do to make it more even as a beginner? I use a digital piano with touch sensitivity. Yes, there are lots of exercises. I would recommend the book A Dozen A Day. They have lots of good exercises for this kind of thing and also the Hannon exercises, which was previously mentioned. But I would also recommend on a general level, try and play all the way to the bottom of the key. A lot of the time when people are trying to play piano, especially at the beginner level, you're trying to press the key very lightly and end up not playing it at all. But in order to play something piano, you've got to play right to the bed of the key, but just slowly rather than quickly. Just try and relax your hand and get your fingers to move. And over time, you will gain much more control over them. And a bonus question. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. Thank you for asking. And if you made it this far into the video, let me know how you are in the comments. And also, if you have any questions, then let me know in the comments and I may answer them in a future video. And if you want to see my reaction to my subscribers playing, then head on through and I will see you there.